Good afternoon, no, welcome. Yeah. This is the uh, Tuesday, May 17, 2016 uh, work session of the Marion City Council. Welcome everyone. Um, so, we begin with finance. Yeah, Your Honor, the first one, or the only one that I have uh, starred is the public hearing on the budget amendment. Uh, this is something we do every year as we compare uh, year-to-date expenditures with um, plus what we're going to spend here be between now and the end of June with actually what we had budgeted for this year that we did way back uh, in March of 2015. So, you know, it's kind of hard and difficult and to, to budget that far in advance. You never really know what's going to happen. But um, anyway, this year as we compare actual expenditures to um, what we did have budgeted by law, we cannot ex exceed that spending authority uh, without a budget amendment. And so there was for several reasons that we did. Um, we do need to increase the budget. Uh, just to give you a couple, for example, we had some uh, TIF payments that were not really planned for. Um, there was some carryover of purchases that we budgeted in the prior year that we did not purchase. So we carried that money over and we're going to buy that equipment this year. Uh, we had several people leave uh, for various reasons and we had to pay out their accumulated leave, vacation, and that type of thing. We had some land and right away acquisitions um, that was not budgeted. Uh, un unbudgeted uh, repairs, purchases, some facility, facility planning. Uh, we had, of course, our census in there. Um, we also had our new software that we just uh, are acquiring and implementing that was not budgeted in the current year. So there's uh, some big ticket items that really spread clear across all the different programs and functions. So we need to just amend the budget to allow us to spend that additional funds and not be in violation of the state code. Questions? Yeah, I do. Uh, I got the uh, accounts payable invoice and the St. Luke's Workwell Solutions, $11,000 for an assorted physicals. Who got physicals that, I mean, I can understand pre-employment physicals and I can understand hepatitis shots, but holy cow, there's a whole bunch of uh, physicals here for anywhere from 200 to 400 dollars I think a lot of those and and maybe Jason can speak to that but I think the fire department had to go through and do their annual physicals for a lot of those yeah Wes um, we have annual physicals required physicals for the firefighters okay the well it, see it doesn't say that on here yeah. it just says physical I'm thinking hmm. well I know work wells where we get our physicals so I would as I would assume like Wes said those are okay. probably coming from our personnel okay and you're physically fit Last I checked. <laughs> Thank you. Mary Lou, also for your information on physicals, uh, the police department is required every year to give additional physicals for people on the bomb squad and also on hazmat, meth labs, and they have to do that every year on all of them. There's at least, I would say, 12 every year additional that we have to do up and beyond anything else. Okay. Thank you. We have some... Uh, on the west on the budget, uh, uh, will that make our um, percentage go up uh, for the uh, property tax? No, it really shouldn't affect our, our tax levy. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, the tax levy. That's no, this is most of the money is coming from things that we bonded for last year, for example. Okay. Uh, the, so the money's there. It's just we didn't spend it last year, or most of it was carried over. So we're spending that now. Okay. But it really was a lot of it just wasn't budgeted. So we need to amend the budget, but it's really not going to affect um, the percentage. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear for everyone that 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 doesn't change the the, the levy. Thank you. So th is this money that was expected to be spent at some point? It just wasn't budgeted in last year? Is that For the most part. Um, I don't know if, Lon, you have any additional comments you want to? 
Yeah, for a lot of those bigger projects, one of the um, challenges is um, estimating when an expenditure is going to occur. If you think about a construction project, for example, if you have a good spring, you know, we might be anticipating that you'll spend 30% of the cost of the project. If the contractor gets a good spring, all of a sudden they're 50% of the way through the project. So it's not unusual for them to bridge across different fiscal years. A lot of it just depends on when the bills occur. Uh, the other thing that can impact it is uh, on the engineering side, if you think about um, the bidding climate where we had to bid a lot of projects with late start dates in April of the following year. Um, that can push those expenses into two different fiscal years than the one that you were originally anticipating. So uh, in most cases, this is not necessarily something you'd consider to be a brand new expenditure that, exp that uh, um, kind of materialized out of nowhere, but it's an expenditure that just the timing hit in a different piece than we anticipated. Okay, questions? Okay, thank you. Nothing else on public, or on, on uh, finance? And then I have something to follow up on Mary Lou's. The, the uh, invoice report that we get, um, it's, it's broken out by accounts. Uh, could we get a, maybe in that, uh, an addendum to it that says what the accounts are that that's going to? We should be able to. That's a, probably a good question. I'm not. Well, that would have answered her question. Yeah, she I mean, would have seen that it went With the new software, we have a whole different new account structure. Okay. Which I'm sure you're probably not familiar with, but I can see that you try and get something. Yeah. That way she would have seen it went to fire and police if we had a, a index showing what the what those accounts are. Thanks. Okay. Police. Fire. Fire. Sorry. Good afternoon, Council. Jason Hansen, Assistant Chief of the Fire Department. Um, I'm here to uh, request approval for purchase. The remaining items for our SCBA purchase that I've been here a couple times for um, since October. The memo I sent has an addendum made to it from the October memo in regards to some of the items that were previously spoken about. If you go to the end at the addendum, um, it addresses our final purchase and it's a quote from Feld Fire in the amount of $23,709 and this is for um, storage bottles and um, attachments to complete the SCBA purchase for our fill station and compressor purchase. Uh, as I state in my addendum, it's to address the funding and final purchasing for the SCBA replacement. Note in the previous paragraph from the previous memo that the funds remaining for this project were $57,643. Uh, the April 7th Council agenda approved the purchase of the compressor and fill station off the GSA bid that was in the amount of $33,874.05, which has been ordered. Um, I don't know when its delivery time is yet. Um, that being said, the quote attached is from Feld in the amount of $23,709 to cover item three above and the necessary attachments to complete the system. It's the 10 spec bottles. It's they're essentially big storage bottles for air that we use on our fill station to fill our SCBA cylinders and the attachments to hook up to the fill station. Um, the last two purchases total $57,613.05, which is $60 less than the projected number. However, in the previous memo from October, we did not have installation and shipping charges included in that. Well, this uh, bid actually has $2,000 worth of installation, so we're well under the projected amount that we're uh, foreseeing having to spend. Anybody have any questions with that? Question? Anybody understand it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Engineering. Uh, items two and three are for the 2016 Low Park Lighting Project. We did receive three bids on May 10th. Uh, the low bid was for $79,173 from Trey Electric. This is a project we're not used to estimating, so as you can see, we had a favorable uh, bid of only 51.5% of the engineer's estimate. Uh, 
it was a good bidding climate for this project, but also we weren't sure on our estimate. We were a little something we're not used to. Uh, work will begin no later in April 30th of 2017 and have uh, 20 working days. We are recommending uh, awarding to Trey Electric Corporation. Questions? Dan, that's all on the English uh, side over there. Is there any lighting out on the uh, 10th Street side? Uh, I, I no, no, this is all back on the west okay. uh, with a new parking lot and the Irish Drive uh, section of uh, the park. The at some point, could we or I or somebody request we look at a decent street light at 10th and Connection? Okay. Yeah, we had kids going across that street all the time. No. And what we have are these subdivision street lights. Yeah, that's our standard light for that intersection, yeah. but we can and add we if need we, a, we can evaluate We need it for something that. that lights up that intersection for safety, I think. Okay. Okay, we'll thank look you. At it. Uh, item number four, Your Honor, is the proposal to purchase a 2016 Toyota uh, Tacoma, not a Tundra. I think last time we misinterpreted uh, as a Tundra. Uh, we're proposing that we would replace our 2012 Honda, Honda CRV that we bought for our previous administrative assistant or administrative, excuse me, assistant city engineer. Uh, I'll get it right eventually. Uh, that CRV now is not really um, the appropriate vehicle with our new technician, so we're proposing that we would uh, transfer that vehicle to the building department to increase their fleet for a potential new position and then buy a new uh, 16 uh, Tacoma for our technician that we've added in the last year. Uh, this would require us to purchase out of a non-budgeted item. It probably wouldn't be until after July 1st, uh, but it'd be $25,490. Any questions? So you said this was non-budgeted and an unexpected expense? It is an unexpected expense. Uh, it would be an additional $9,900, $9,990 to the budget. Uh, we would um, be adding to the building department. They would be accept accepting this. It only has 7,400 miles on it, so it's like a new vehicle for them. Um, but we, our technicians going out inspecting projects and stuff, and the CRV just does not meet that requirement. Questions? questions on that? Okay. That's all I have unless somebody else has other questions. Any questions on anything else on that, on the engineering items? I just, I just went out, Dan, and watched about 15 school buses go through the roundabout today. Went right through it. So yeah, we received several compliments today. Uh, we went out and kind of monitored it for a while after it opened this morning. Well, actually last night around 10, but um, a lot of school buses. We saw two semis go through at the same time, dr different directions. Uh, went real well, so it seems to be working well. Uh, I watched them going both ways, and you know, they went through it pretty slow, but you know they went right through it. So. Didn't have to stop, though. No, didn't have to <laughs> stop. <laughs> yeah, I, I went through it last night. I had no, I, I wasn't aware that it was open yet, and it was in that area, and I went through it and um, I, I can see what it, that it's going to um, it, it's going to fulfill its intended purpose of slowing down traffic and making that intersection safer I mean it's just and they did works well yeah and they did get the color on the highlands they are darker so it does stand out away from the concrete we're also waiting for our AC to set the meter for the street lights. They're not on yet, so it's a little dark out there right now. But as soon as they get that done, it'll be well lit. How far ahead of the time frame was this completed? Uh, the meter itself? No, no, the project. Oh, seems like it was done significantly, but I'm not sure how many days it was. They used about half the working days, yeah. I think. Was yeah. they were quick. like you had 45 days, and it was yeah. like 20. I mean, it seemed like it. The jackhammers just started last <laughs> week. <laughs> they got right on it, so it went well. Very good. Well, good what I notice is you guys did not encounter the same person I did, <laughs> who was in a very large SUV, 
uh, talking on the phone, and by God, she wasn't going to give me the not. So I just stopped. <laughs> okay. Sure, Good job, man. About. <laughs> Planning. Good afternoon. As you can see from the packet, there's quite a bit of stuff going on right now. It's, this is our usually one of our busier months, um, getting ready for the summer, and then the next <laughs> month kind of slows down. We get to hit again in uh, late July and early August for the fall round. So I just wanted to briefly touch on the motion <coughs> to receive and file. Um, we've got a couple items in here that I think we've been talking about in, in general terms, but I just want you to know that they're kind of rolling through now. Um, so we've got a request for a future land use map amendment and, and uh, rezoning and, and development uh, proposal for the scenic development LLC. This is the property, and I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail unless you guys have questions, but that's the property West Albernet Road, north of East Robbins. It's part of the annexation proceeding um, that's going on as well. So you can see that packet. You can see what they're proposing. And it's a pretty lengthy um, uh, document, but it kind of outlines everything that's going on in that property. Um, we've also received uh, a similar request for a future land use map amendment and uh, rezoning for some property in Uptown Marion, south of uh, 6th Ave, uh, near, the, near the 7th and 7th roundabout. Um, that's, I don't know if there's any questions on that. That's something that we haven't talked about much lately, but uh, we've received we are starting to receive requests for property to be rezoned on the south side of 6th Avenue to commercial because of the change in alignment uh, um, and direction of the traffic, from the heavier traffic from 7th to 6th. So I think we're going to start to see some of that uh, come uh, before the council and the planning commission in the near future. So mm -hmm. just something to be prepared for. Um, and obviously this is receiving files, so there'll be more information to come on it. Um, the uh, the next item C is just a final site development plan for Bob Berger out off of Highway 13. So that's nothing too um, extraordinary. It's very similar to what was proposed previous. And then we've also got the uh, first United Methodist Church preliminary and final site development plans um, for Highway 13 and 35th um, Avenue. So that'd be north. That'd probably be that's the most north. Uh, development proposal on Highway 13 that we've seen to date, and there's a number of uh, issues with with that project, uh, primarily related to 35th Street and the improvements. And we'll be talking about that in the future. But just so you're aware that those projects have come in, and they they're pretty big projects. And I think we we tried to highlight them for the council so there's awareness of what's going on and and what we're working on in the department as well. Uh, it helps for us to know what's coming up. So thank you. No questions on those. I'll just keep moving on. Um, the uh, next item identified is the setting of the date for uh, June 9th for a land use map amendment and rezoning request uh, for Platinum Homes. This is out off Highway 13, um, south of 29th Avenue. Um, and I would like to just identify this property. I know we're just at the set date. But the council's probably starting to hear comments, questions, and maybe receiving a few phone calls related to this rezoning request. Uh, the property is identified in the red. Um, and then there, what's being proposed there is to go from commercial and it's a down zoning to residential to provide for the, op to provide for, uh, the apartment buildings that are currently being built out there to expand north. I think there's four more additional apartment buildings being proposed to go north. At the planning commission meeting last week, there was quite a few concerns by the neighbors. Uh, most of them were related to the use as uh, apartments and, and multifamily. Um, so you'll probably start to hear conversations about that. Um, and I think we've received a couple correspondence on our already. Maybe not at the council level, but I know we've, we've received. I've some received a couple. I there also have. I think I forwarded. Yep. Forwarded okay. There you go. I knew. I knew I'd receive some from somewhere. We got about. There was probably ten or twelve. Um, residents at the meeting voicing concerns. Um, which roads are going through to 29th? 
So it's 50th. I know it's over. Prairie Hill Drive will go through and extend. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm extend and then 50th. So the 50th and the other one will both correct connect. Okay. What's the time frame on those two? Because I know with talking from the residents mm -hmm. there that Indeed. they're worried about more congestion going down their streets because mm -hmm. there is only basically off of 13 there's only one road unless you go all the way out to uh, yeah I, I you know there's one thing that you're going to hear a lot about is is traffic on 50th 50th is going to become kind of a collector street it's always been identified to connect and, and I think most of the folks understood when they bought that that was going to connect uh, I think I think it's hat from the comments a lot of it, things happening faster than they anticipated which is not an uncommon uh, comment related to development here at the city council so <laughs> I, I I do I understand what? where they're coming from but it's it's one of those things where the plat's been approved for 10 years and we're just getting to the end of it so stuff's starting to happen this is the development so lot one here um, is there's a proposed a mixed-use building so there's commercial on the first floor apartments above um, it's it's going to be a probably one of the first true mixed-use buildings built and I mean built I shouldn't say that the one off East Post is pretty is is very similar um, but so there'll be apartments above commercial below parking around and then with this building which they're planning to move forward with quickly they're going to be proceeding with the road out to The, will be the only commercial right there, otherwise, or are there going to be commercial on the north side of 29th also? Uh, there is commercial currently zoned on the north side. It's really low. Um, there's that's going to be a tough site to build on, but it is zoned commercial. Uh, I think it's a it's a planned commercial district. Um, so, and their original plan was to do the mixed use on this on both these lots, correct? Well, was the mixed the the so commercial. commercial, just straight commercial. So they could do, they could do mixed use, but the, but it, the zoning is commercial. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Commercial. Correct. But I mean, the developer was originally going to do he mixed use on both. No, that was it was zoned. Um, Eldon McMillan, who previously owned the property, had it zoned. It's been zoned commercial for many many years. Yeah. Um, he passed away, and and. Uh, Barry Smith bought the property, and his desire is to move forward with more apartments and then do the commercial on the corner. Gotcha. Yep, yep. The One of the things that we tried to stress at the Planning Commission meeting was there's a lot of concern with the traffic generated from uh, apartments. C3 zoning is a, is a pretty intense zoning district, which would provide for fast food and pretty heavy retail components. Um, so I don't, and, and I know there was some comments in the correspondence about they were really hoping to be family friendly, commercial, and there, we have we have no um, ability to zone for whatever is family friendly. So I mean, once you open that C3 zoning district, I mean there there's a number of uses that I think the neighborhood would probably not want to see. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, you know, fast food is available there. You know, the retail components are, are as well so I think the mixed use is going to be nice for the neighborhood and I think the uh, the apartments are going to be a nice buffer to highway 13 so I, I think this all is going to come together nicely but we're set tonight we're just or Thursday we're going to set the date for the public hearing for June first meeting in June um, I, I've been trying to uh, reach out to one of the individuals in the neighborhood just have a sit down meeting with them and talk a little bit about what C3 is and, and what the uh, residential component and the differences are. So I think there's some confusion on what uh, there was going to be by virtue of a thought and not necessarily zoning and what could actually go there. Tom, what is that? Uh, that area is about five and a half acres. Is that, yeah. am I looking yeah. at that correctly? Okay. Yep, that's correct. <coughs> any uh, deten uh, detention basining, any? in that area I'm sorry a detention basining uh, um, these the storm water and everything's being handled I, there's not a detention basin specifically on the sites uh, I think it's being that's handled. lower than the road so 
I'm sorry. It's lower than the road, than the Highway 13 and 29. Correct. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, the site plan does accommodate for the for detention. And I think it might be handled actually through um, the Squaw Creek. If you go west, we got that large natural wetland area. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a part of the basin. I don't. Dan left. So. He's dead. <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that that's all flows to the west and into that basin. Yeah. Would you ask that, make sure that's? They've yeah, and that all come out in the preliminary the, in the in the platting of it. Right now, we're just right. at the zoning and land use amendment. But yep, yep, that'll certainly be addressed. So anyway, that like I said, it's just a set date for public hearing. But I did want to go into that. I know the council's. So you're going to be meeting with the concerned I've, people? I've reached, they've reached out to me, and I, we've been playing some phone tag trying to get, set up a time to meet with them. Yep. I think there's a neighborhood group that wants to sit down and have a conversation about it. Good. I'm sure that will be helpful. Yep. Thank you. The next item, number three, is a, a rezoning request um, for property off East Post Road to go from uh, 01 to R6. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the views. Um, this project... Is another senior project that we've been working with uh, the, de the developer on. There's a number of items on the agenda related to this. So the the property is behind Frank Maggot and Company, uh, and just just east of Menards. It's the back side of their pro of, of Maggot's property. It will access onto Oak uh, Park. It's Oak Park uh, Road there. Um, It'll be uh, 100 units, uh, 40 assisted living, 40 skilled, and 30 memory care. So it's going to be a, a, a facility with a number of different um, levels of care. So this will be the access point off Oak Brook, and the, and the facility, will, facility will fill a lot, uh, largely the site. Um, there's another access point. Is that off 11th Street? Uh, it's I can't remember the road that comes down south from south into 11th Street, but it, it's. But there is there are two. Access yes, there's two access points, correct? And the fire department's reviewed it, and they're they're uh, okay with the proposed. Here's a better, just kind of a better drawing of the the site layout. You'll see parking all around. Um, there's areas for expanded parking if necessary. Um, so it's a very nice facility. Uh, we're really uh, happy with the elevations and the renderings. I think the council had this in the packet. That's the um, right so it's a, it's a good looking building, and I think it's going to sit nicely back in there and provide a um, good place for the residents. So as I said, this is going to be the rezoning request for the project, and then um, there was a request received, and the council has that for uh, the final reading, so they can go straight to the preliminary and final site development plan. Um, they are trying to get the project underway, um, so that, that request is before you. Uh, the next item, at star number seven, is the preliminary plat related to the project as well. Um, and they're requesting to move forward, obviously on a fairly quick schedule. Um, to move the project ahead. i just point out that if we, I don't know what the, if, if the third reading doesn't get waived, the preliminary plat uh, will need to be pushed to the next agenda. And we are still waiting for one item, and that's uh, access, ag access agreement to um, Oak Brook Drive. So we're still waiting on that, and I'll report to the council on that. We've, all, everything we've heard is that it's been approved and everything's good. We just haven't got the signed, sealed, and delivered document. So we don't want to move forward with any approvals on that plat until we have that document. So I'll report on Thursday on the status of that as well. And we've removed seven and nine from the agenda. Um, no, number nine is, is a separate. Um, that's approving an industrial center east 11th edition final plat memorandum agreement. This is the city owned property that was previously uh, fiber right, 
uh, development site. Um, location there, 44th, 3rd Avenue, highlighted in red. Um, so the proposed lot configuration, 44th, 3rd Avenue, so you'd have one lot, a large lot on the northeast side, two lots, or one, two, three, and then four lot subdivision. Uh, there's a lot of wetland on this piece. It it's, uh, seems like a large lot, but that's a lot of it's unusable. So this did go to the Planning Commission uh, on Monday night, last night, and was uh, forwarded to the City Council for approval. Any questions on that? Well, I think we've got that one. We've got some development interest as uh, in, and we're trying to get that one rolling as soon as possible. Get that property over into private hands and not into the city's hands. I don't know if you had any more comments on that. Yep. Um, number 10 is not starred, but we did receive additional information from the IBA Air, IB Airs uh, Acres folks, and that's the annexation uh, area off 10th Street. I, there was quite a bit of information provided there. They had proposed an annexation agreement. Several of the council members were in a meeting with them. Um, and staff went through what we were uh, kind of proposing there. Both documents are for your review. If there's any questions, let me know. But um, uh, we're just we're working under the assumption that we're moving forward with the city's position on that, um, which is the city staff's position on that. So if there's something other than that, um, please let us know. Well, my understanding is all these people want is in writing what is expected of them and of the city. That's all they wanted. We've laid out in the in the document what we're willing to lay out, and that is um, in, basically I think the biggest thing is sewer and the cost. And uh, staff's not in a position to provide a cost estimate for that because there's no need for it at this point in time. So we tried to lay out what we could. We established within the the document the parameters in which we would operate under if something happens, and uh, just kind of what exists mm -hmm. now if something happens. So. But they just want it in writing so that the city is held to something. If they are, then the city should be too. The document's in there. If you have questions on it, let me know. Okay. I have a question. Yep. So looking through the packet, there was the two documents. I didn't know which one was from Ivy Acres, and I don't know which one was from the city. Can Second one was from the city. Second, okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? No, that was it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For now. Okay. <laughs> um, number 11 and 12 are related, and this is a motion to receive and file correspondence from Mr. Ransford regarding a request to encroach in East West Alley for um, access to his property. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. I'm not going to go through that unless there's questions on it. He just needs to get into the alley, which is an unimproved alley, grass, grass strip, actually, to get to the river's properties. He's, uh, there's a we're willing, we're, we're supportive of that request. So on the, the picture there, that garage in the back, I mean, he can't get to that with a vehicle, can he? He's That's probably it. using the alleyway. Looks like this. Currently. I mean, it's a public alleyway. Yeah, can he get in, in there with the, I guess you can. Looks awfully narrow. Maybe that's just yeah. the shadow that yeah. makes it look narrow. The shadow of that vehicle, that, that the house down to here. the lower right. Yeah. You know, that seems like Does that's awfully, that's pretty close. Yeah. So is the entire sidewalk on the alley? Is it going to be on the alley? I believe it is. Yeah. No. Be a four foot uh, sidewalk within the alleyway. All, all on the alley. Yep. What, what, I'm just curious why isn't this alley a candidate for vacation like we've done with others? Um, it probably is. Um, I say probably. 
as I've identified before with the city council that the alley vacations are extremely staff heavy on time frame. And right now our policy is we get, I think, uh, I want to say it's like 10% of the average assessed value of the properties adjacent to it. I don't, Dave might know right off the 30% of the average assessed value of the adjacent property. Um, if you recall the Sutton alley vacation and how much time was spent on that, that's just one of the, um, there's just a lot of time involved. Uh, there's staff time, attorney time, legal work, ab abstract. I mean, it's, there's just a ton of time involved in it. Um, it's just one of those things that if we want to proceed, we don't like to do half alleys because what has happened in the past is we've, we get these stub, stub alleys and then they're off, uh, kind of the property lines aren't are contiguous and it just creates quite a mess. So I, at this point, I, I don't think we have the time and the staff to go through a process like this if we're trying to do a full alley. Um, this would involve three property owners, so there'd be potentially three pieces involved in that um, vacation and sale. Um, it's just, unless there's, you want to hear more on that, that's, <laughs> it's a long, curious. it's a lengthy process and it doesn't it just really. It be, it would be cleaner, but I, mean, I understand yep. what you're saying, yep. so. And that's probably a policy we need to look at and how we do that. I, I think if there's a desire for us to sell and, and get rid of these properties, I think there needs to be a way for the city to be recouped for their time and the process included in that. Because I would, I would venture to the guess that we're getting a very s small return on what it cost us to actually get rid of the property. Well, what, what determines what you sell it for? We just have a city policy on it. it Change the policy. Yeah, Change that's that's what I said. I just think the policy needs to be looked at. So. But it's not up to the city to be making a profit on this stuff, is it? Well, he's just saying recoup our, our no, costs. Well, he's not saying make a profit. Yeah. Well, yeah, but he said the profit level is, is very small, and if we changed it, then it would be a higher amount. No, I'm I'm saying we need to, to, Just to, recoup, to recoup the cost the to cost provide the, the service city has to sell in, it. In, in vacating it and putting the time into selling it and the expense okay. of it. Now, what he's asking for is to be able to put in a sidewalk that's three feet wide for uh, wheelchair accessibility. Is that wide enough? Four feet. I thought it was four feet. Oh, it's four feet. Yeah. I would like to. Ah, uh, just look at that. No, approximately three feet wide and 100 feet long. Mm. That's in the letter that Mr. Ransford wrote. Uh, I can't say for sure, but he would be the, I don't think we were going to tell him how wide to build the sidewalk. Well, just. I mean, if he wants three, I'm assuming it's a cost thing, so. Well, three feet wide is not that wide for a wheelchair. He's asking for a four foot encroachment. Well, he says a three foot one. I guess at this point, we're, we're recommending going through with, with what he's proposing. If there's other okay. questions or comments on it, let me know. Okay. Uh, item number 13, uh, as the council's aware, we went out, we went out, uh, we submitted RFQs, our, our published RFQ notice for qualifications for uh, basically taking the next step in the central corridor plan um, and really diving down a little deeper into that. Uh, we submitted, we put those out for bid two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I think. Bids were due last Friday. Um, we received, we only received one proposal. It was a short turnaround, um, but we did receive one proposal and, and it was from Stanley Consultants and OPN as a team, which we're um, pretty excited about. Stanley Consultants has been a, been involved in the projects from the get-go. Uh, many of their staff were involved in the original discussions regarding uh, the environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working um, intimately with the, all the developers on the actual uh, cleanup and uh, there are direct contact between the city and the DNR for all uh, phase one, phase two uh, environmental uh, proceedings. Um, we're working with them on 
wetland mitigation. So they're, they're, very, they're very knowledgeable of the project. Uh, OPN Architects has been working with many of the developers in the area. And um, so we're, we're pretty excited about the, the opportunity to, to move forward with that group. Um, Dan is not here, but Stanley is also very versed in uh, engineering and <coughs> transportation and traffic. They're a larger firm and can really handle uh, all aspects of a project like this. Um, so we think we've got the, uh, the engineering, the stormwater, and the land use um, um, covered with Stanley, as well as the lands. They have a landscape architecture division as well. I can, I can pass out the um, uh, qualifications that they submitted if you'd like to see them between now and, and Thursday, or I can send them to you via email. But uh, we're, in the, well, so from a landscape perspective, they've got that covered. And then the vertical infrastructure and the design, I think, is one of the things the council has really been um, kind of hammering us on and making sure that what we ha what happens in that corridor looks good and is Marion, and it continues to uh, to be that way. So they've they've engaged uh, OPN architects to be a part of that process. So I think uh, I think we've got the all the bases covered as it relates to moving forward, and uh, we'd be uh, we're certainly recommending that we proceed in that manner. So at this point, we did, this was not a uh, contractual, uh, uh, it wasn't an RFP, so there's no proposal. So at this point, we would uh, move forward and negotiate a contract for services with, uh, with the group and then bring that back for council for approval. So any questions on that? Okay. I did not send out the information because the uh, qualifications were due Friday at, at 5, so I didn't have them all. I didn't know how many I was going to receive. So I know we're kind of turning this around quickly, but uh, you know, as, as you guys know, there's a lot of things going on in the corridor right now, so we just need to keep it moving. If you want to reach out to me, I can send you the information um, via email. So. Tom, have we, uh, <clears throat> have we hammered out that issue of elevation drawings uh, at times of permits? Is that, do we have that hammered out the way we want that, or do we need to address that again? I, I think um, I know that's been talked about in the past, but I don't know if we've. If we probably need it. We need it more detailed. Yep. We're getting. We're getting better ones than we've ever received in the past, but we have not ever outlined exactly what they need to be. We're about three quarters of the way through a design standards review committee recommendation, and uh, I think that'll address it. But certainly, that's still an issue that we have with the submittals. Is what what we're getting as far as an elevation. What do you recommend we do then? Obviously, it it sounds I'm hearing that we need to get council direction uh, to direct staff for that, and do we need to go to your department or where? Or I mean, I'm trying to figure out where do we insert that so that, like you said, we got a bazillion things going on. We don't want to <laughs> find out in the eleventh hour we we got we didn't get an elevation on this, and it's not anywhere what it was supposed to have been. Yeah. Where do we go with that? I think uh, right now we're getting most of what we need within the corridor because we have the design standards. But really, we okay. probably need some action to, to um, for council directing us to review our uh, submittal requirements for uh, building permits, and then we could move forward with that. Okay. Let me let me make sure that that wording would be correct and get it to the council on, on either Thursday or in a in a memo. That way you have the appropriate language for that. That would be that great because I know there's a lot of discussion on things. You know, we have our defined corridor, but it's leading into and going out of that corridor that, you know, I don't think anybody really wants a huge transition. So it would be nice if we, yeah, you know, that we do have that. And quite frankly, I think we should have them anyway. But, um, yes. you know, it's just, it's just going to be the nature of the beast as we deal with it. So, yeah. okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I just yep. want to make sure we were moving with that. That's a conversation that we'd had in the past. I want to make sure that it's not getting dropped. So no, I appreciate that because that, uh, that only helps us review things and so we're not right. passing through things that aren't really cohesive. So that's Perfect. Good Thanks, Tom. Yep, no problem. Um, if there's no other questions on the RFQ and proceeding with the negotiations, uh, number 14, uh, Mr. Hoduck, I know there was conversation regarding the request for uh, uh, an encroachment or acquisition, actually, of property down there. Um, he was not at the meeting, and I wanted to make sure he had an opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I put it on the agenda and then found out he's off this week on vacation. So <laughs> we'll just won't discuss that today, and uh, we'll move that forward to a future agenda, and I'll make sure that he's around when we get that set. So, 
Any questions for me on anything? Thanks, guys. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. Before we uh, move into the uh, administration agenda, I'd like to uh, just go ahead and remove items number seven and number nine. Uh, number seven, unfortunately, we checked today and our opportunity on that one, it looks like it's been claimed for Lynn County already, so we don't have the opportunity to do that. And then number nine, um, we're going through and um, doing a whole budget review on the Art Place America grant, just making sure everything is fitting together the way it's supposed to, so we don't want to take any action on that at this time. Uh, I know the council has not had a chance to review the naming policy, so I'll just hit some of the highlights of it and then you can review it and give us some feedback on it. Um, but essentially, as the council's aware, uh, we ran into uh, an issue where we don't really have any kind of an established policy or procedure when it comes to naming city-owned uh, lands or facilities. And so we've put a draft together for you to review. Uh, it outlines not only the process, but the criteria under which we will contemplate the naming of facilities, buildings, um, rooms inside of buildings, and uh, other types of things where you have naming opportunities. Um, Obviously, there's some things in there that uh, you would want to see, including that uh, we're prohibited, um, prohibiting the naming of things that uh, might cost a uh, negative image on the cities. Um, as you get into it a little bit further, uh, Section F says that existing names are considered to have historic recognition, so we're not really seeking to um, try to make anything that's already been named run back through this process. Um, I and J, those sections deal with the namings of things for individuals. Uh, one of the things that I did discover during my research is that uh, naming policies are typically set up to name facilities posthumously, and the variation occurs in how long um, someone needs to be deceased before they'll uh, contemplate doing the naming. I picked three years, but that's something that would be entirely at the discretion of the city council. Some have one year, some have five years. It really was all over the map. I just kind of tried to pick the one that uh, was about the average of what what um, communities seem to adopt. Uh, it's intended to make sure that um, if we're contemplating naming a facility or a park or someone, something after an individual, that they have made a significant impact on the community of Marion and establishes some criteria under which you can judge that. Uh, J uh, addresses the naming for living individuals but does exempt ones for uh, living individuals that are grandfathered in. Um, one of the things that this does open the door for, which Marion has not really done, is if, if you get into Section 3C, um, commemorative streets. Uh, you do see this under communities, but it's different than going in and renaming a street. So, for example, a commemorative street, if you think about the Pucker Street Historic District, well, that's on 8th Avenue. This would open the door, for example, for a complementary sign to maybe, say, Pucker Tr Street or something like that, in addition to the regular sign. So you'd have your address that would be your official address that your emergency services, GIS, everything else would refer to. Um, some communities that have a lot of historic districts have had a lot of success with this. Uh, I think probably the one that's most advanced in the area in this practice is Iowa City where they've got the different um, toppers on their street uh, sign poles in lots of different subdivisions to designate and provide a sense of the different neighborhoods around the community. Uh, that's just something that was in a lot of them. Marion's never really had anything related to that, so we put that in there again for you to provide feedback as well. So um, as you get a chance, take a look at it. Let us know if you have any questions or anything. But given the short turnaround, I was not anticipating having this on for action on Thursday. I figured you'd want more time to review it than that. Uh, again, if you I feel comfortable with it and you're ready to go, then we can. But yeah. it's a pretty significant policy and I thought it deserves some perusal by council. I think that makes sense. It's one of those things that we probably need to read it, think about it, come back and read it again. and. You know, because we want this to be a lasting, you know, a lasting policy. And so we are seeking some thought into it. We are seeking to provide uh, some discretion for the various boards and commissions that have exercised that ability. You know, the park boards, if someone wants to commemorate a tree or something like that for someone in a park or do a memorial bench or something like that. That's typically been held at the board and commission level. The ones that are more significant than that um, would, would normally come to council for action. Questions for Lon on that? So we could please review it and, you know, ask questions, ask 
Did, did, did they ask you or, or Amanda who, who put this together? You did? I did the initial draft. Uh, Amanda's the one that made it legible. <laughs> okay. She was so. the scriber. Okay. So send it to either one of us. So will this eventually be a standalone in the the policies of Marion, or will it be a? Yeah, we have a separate policy book for adopted policies of the city council. So things like your procurement policy, um, those are all in their own policy book. This would become one of those. So it'll stand alone. It won't be a supplement of something. No, it'd be on its own. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, item two, uh, as I outlined in my memo, we've had several items brought to council uh, in the last year or so regarding um, elections, how they're conducted in Marion, uh, including some proposed changes to the city charter and how Marion approaches elections. Uh, thought it might be best for the council to get a briefing from someone who has uh, experience with this, not only locally, but also works with communities all across the state and sees how they do uh, their elections. So we invited Jeff Schott from the uh, Institute of Public Affairs to come in and give the council a briefing on what he sees across the state. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Schott with the Institute of Public Affairs, the University of Iowa, and Marion resident and taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got two and potentially three things I uh, wanted to uh, discuss with you, and please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Uh, one is the issue of the uh, ward election system. Uh, number two is the issue of the runoff elections or primary elections. And number three, if you're really interested, I remember how we got to that uh, policy with regard to uh, paying for alleys. And I can give you the background on that. Because uh. I remember council spent months on that particular issue way back when. Um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with the issue of the uh, ward uh, election system and also let you know I had nothing to do with it. It was in place when I got here at the city of Marion uh, at the time of the Spanish-American War. Um, but I, I do think it's a very good system and I actually recommend it to the cities I work with all across the state of Iowa and I'll, I'll give you the, at least the, my rationale for that. Uh, the concept being that uh, to be a ward representative as opposed to at large, uh, the individual has to live in the ward, but they, you are elected at large. And the reason I think this is a good system is that I have been in cities, have actually worked in cities, where the individual, the ward representative, uh, of course, has to live in the ward, but is only elected by the, the residents of that ward. The problem there is that I have seen individuals get so solely focused on the issues of their ward, they don't think about the rest of the city. And I think as, as council representatives, obviously you have uh, uh, an important role to play for the entire city, not just your particular ward. Uh, as an example, uh, before I came to uh, Marionette, worked in Muscatine, and they had that other system. And the council member from the, let's say, fourth ward, all that individual cared about was street repairs in their ward, regardless of whether their streets were better or worse than other wards in the city. I think the situation is where, of course, you have to live in the ward. They, you want to make sure there's good representation throughout the entire community on the city council, but ultimately, as uh, uh, members of the city council, you're accountable to the entire uh, city uh, at election time. The other side of that, and I've seen this happen, I, I don't want to mention the name of the city, is a city actually a little bit larger than Marion, where uh, they got hit by the flood, and you had ward representatives who uh, their particular ward was not affected by the flood. And they really resisted wanting to expend city resources and considerable resources on flood recovery, flood uh, remediation in areas of the town outside of their ward. Again, if they are going to be 
accountable to the entire city at the ballot box, I think that provides uh, that broader perspective. So again, uh, I have frequently suggested that the, I'll call it the Marion system, is a very effective system where you you're sure you got good representation across the you know the entire community, but ultimately you're looking at the whole city, um, and um, uh, I think that's a, that's a good way to go. Do you, do you have a sense of which system is more widely used? Oh, more widely used is the other system. There's no question about that. But it's not you know Marion is not unique. You're not the only city. But I would say there's probably more city, not probably, I'm sure there are more city. I've not done a study of it. I haven't calculated it out, but I'm just from experience, I know there are more cities that have the other system. But I'm not sure that necessarily makes it a better system. Questions about that? Questions on that issue? Yeah. Jeffrey, is there a... I mean, the, the one problem that I foresee is that one section of town can seat the whole city council um, when you vote everybody at large. In the last election, if we had counted votes in Hunters Ridge and a couple of other places, they would have controlled the city election where the ward person, and it isn't unusual for a ward person maybe not to win their ward but be elected, I hear what you're saying, but it shouldn't be that one section of town uh, who happens to vote can control the whole city, you know, and that that's the one downfall I see. Yeah, I can't speak to what happened in the last election, but Marion's large enough city now that it would be hard pressed for me to see how one one that's, area could and I'm generate. I'm not thinking in the last election. I'm thinking in the past. But you're you're right. We are large enough not to do that. But the unfairness of it is, from a county standpoint, um, Kim, my friend Kim, needed 13 signatures on a ballot or on a petition to run for ward council. I needed 330 because I'm at large. And that isn't our fault, it's the county's fault because they didn't recognize, they don't recognize how the city of Marion elects our officials. So that, in my opinion, if we're going to continue as we are, needs to be corrected. You know, they certainly, uh, if we're all elected at large, we should all require the same number of signatures to run for the seat. Yeah, I know it probably gets back to the charter. Um, yeah, but typically you get a certain percentage of, of the, the voters of the last right. the last that's election. How the, that's how the county does it, yes. I'll give you an extreme example of problem. This is in Anamosa where they have the prison. They had a ward system there. <laughs> More than they one. Do. Count, yeah. <laughs> you know, the census counts the uh, residents of the, of the prison as part of the population. So they had one ward that was... You know, you need to, when you redistrict every 10 years, you have to have equal uh, populations in the different wards. But outside of the prison, only like 50 people who could even run for city council. They eventually got rid of the system in Anamosa, I understand it, and just so everybody's at large, just because it was, it was uh, too, hmm. too challenging. I, you don't have that problem in Marion, I don't think. No. Although there probably should be some people. <laughs> Uh, the second issue has to do with the uh, issue of runoff elections. That, I was here when that change was made, as was the uh, city attorney. Um, at the time, the issue was money, of course. I, as I recall, it was one of our uh, uh, times when we were having some really difficult financial issues. And I don't remember if it was Iowa Trust or it could have been the state property tax freeze. And we were really looking at, council was really looking at work, and we cut we got some, we got some significant budget issues, and we need to make some cuts. And we looked at the issue of how much a primary election cost back then, um, versus the number of people came out to vote at those primary elections. And at that time, the council decided to go with the system of winner take all. We also looked back in history, 
and there had been very, very few cases where there were multiple candidates for any particular position. I know that wasn't the case in the last election, but um, that, that's kind of the background to it. The one thing I would recommend, um, I mean, that's a policy decision, of course, if you want to go to stay with the winner take all and recognizing that that could potentially be somebody could win with less than a 50% majority. Um, if you do decide to go to a primary election, I would strongly recommend you ha hold the primary in October. There's two ways you can do it under Iowa law, as I understand it. You can have the primary in advance of the general election. Whoever wins the, pri the top two candidates who win the primary then are on the ballot in November. Or you can have everybody on the ballot in November if nobody gets the uh, gets 50 percent or plus one of that ballot, then you have a runoff election in uh, December, second week in December, I believe. I have worked with cities that have that runoff election in December, and the problem there is there's a lot of really important things happening in November, December. And even though I, I recognize newly elected officials do not officially take office until January, in most cities, those newly elected mayor, council really get involved right after the election. If you have budget goal setting sessions, city uh, you know, priority goal setting sessions, labor negotiations are going on then, you really want the new council and new mayor involved. They're not making decisions yet, but it's, you know, they're going to be the team after, as of January 1. <coughs> if you have to wait until after that December um, uh, runoff election, uh, you're really losing a lot of time. A lot of cities really struggle with that. I've seen, I've been involved with a number of cities where they really felt like they were behind the eight ball because they really didn't have the team together until uh, December or whatever, 8th, 9th, 10th, something like that. So that, that's kind of the background uh, uh, behind that. The, the, the motivating factor for getting rid of the primaries, uh, when I, at least when I was here, was primarily money. But at the time, council felt we weren't losing a whole lot by, uh, by going to that and just going to a winner take all. So. Jeff, wouldn't we also run into an issue where uh, given our, our geographical location and demographics of our voters, we have a lot of those that have now left state for their winterization, so you wouldn't have the turnout for population votes in November as well, correct? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, of course, you do have write-in or, you know, absentee ballots, and I don't know what percentage mm -hmm. of the uh, vote for city councils, mayor, are absentee, but... I know for, for statewide national elections, it's a fairly significant percentage. I, I'd like to correct myself. I said 3,800, and it's like 12. Nick, do you remember how many signatures you needed? 1,200 for to get on the ballot? For mayor? Yeah. 220. Or 215, 220. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, there, I was thinking the number of votes. I'm sorry. That's why you got all that gray hair. I caused most of that. I'm very <laughs> proud of that. You're right, Paul. You did cause most of it. <laughs> you and the Marion Police Department were the other ones. <laughs> you were on the force. <laughs> is there a, is there a downside to winner take all? I mean, you know, it, you know, I could see a situation if you had ten or twelve candidates. Or position, which, you know, I know that hasn't been the history. You could potentially have somebody get 15% of the vote and get elected. So that would be the downside. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't seen that history here in Marion. It was really unusual. I don't know when the last time, how many, were there three candidates for mayor last time? Three candidates. And when was the last time that happened? Yeah. And it can happen, certainly. Winner got 46%. You know, potentially you could have some big issue where you get a bunch of people running for things. Eh? You could, it could happen, certainly. You know, at the time we thought it was a reasonable uh, solution, and again, we were really struggling to try to pinch every penny, and we thought this was one where there was not going to be a real loss in, in value or a loss in services, certainly no loss in personnel. And uh, I'm sh I don't know what a 
it costs any more for you know, when the county charges you for, for primary elections, but even back whenever we did it 15 years ago, it was not insignificant. Any questions on that? Are you interested in the alley policy? <laughs> sure. There are two reasons for uh, the policy, and I guess it's still in place. As it, the main reason was when you go through the alley vacation, when the city uh, um, um, transmits the uh, property to the owner, the new owner, it is by quit claim deed. It's not a warranty deed, and so that was deemed to be not as valuable as having a, you, know, but you did not want to go through the whole process of warranty, deed, and abstracts, and all that kind of stuff. The other thing, at least at the time, and I remember this pretty clearly, council at that time at least really wanted to get rid of as many alleys as they could, um, both for potential maintenance issues, because uh, you know, city does have a liability with alleys, then also just to get those back on the property tax rolls to the owners and um, particularly for those, and there were a bunch of alleys back then, uh, where they, you know, they were platted, but that's it, and it didn't look like it was an alley, wasn't used as an alley, so uh, it was a policy issue with the council that they really wanted to try to get rid of as many city alleys as possible. So that's the reason for it. Thank you. We well, appreciate your perspective on, on all those topics. Here's another cause of a lot of my gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> she was sneaking out. Your Honor, I, I had a question. Jeffrey, um, I have a question. As sometime user and plan to be more of the Roberts Rules of Order, who I've talked to our city council about, who I don't fit, I don't think fit at all as city council. Have you, I know you said you gave somewhat of a presentation. Have you found any other rules of order that are more suitable to a city government than Roberts? Yeah, I, I, as Paul mentioned, um, I actually gave a presentation to the East Central Iowa Clerks Group at ECOG about a year ago on this issue. And it's not just my position, but I know it's the position of the Iowa League of Cities and their legal staff that cities should not adopt Roberts rules as the city's rules of parliamentary procedure. And what we recommend instead is that the city should adopt their own set of, of rules of procedure, and you're authorized to do that under the Iowa Code. Certainly, you should, and you can refer back to and take those areas of deal, uh, Robert's rules dealing with those strictly parliamentary things, you know, whether it's motions to reconsider, motion seconds, uh, motions to table, those types of things. But the, you know, Robert's rules were not written for legislative bodies such as city councils. You, know, you don't find any reference in Robert's rules to three readings on an ordinance and uh, super majorities and remonstrances if it's a, on certain types of zoning or special assessment cases. Um, it, you know, requirements for uh, uh, public presentations, that type of thing. Uh, there's a lot of... And I don't know, I assume you don't have, has the city adopted rules of procedure other than just Robert's rules? I think that they might be referenced in the, uh, Robert's rules may be referenced in the code at one point. Uh, it was a kind of a tag along, but we don't have anything separate. Yeah, I know that used to be the case. It was strictly Robert's rules. And then even if it's Robert's rules, say which edition? Because, you know, Robert's rules gets revised every so often. Um, what we recommend is the cities should adopt their own rules of procedure, uh, there's a lot of examples out there uh, available on the league website. We've got several examples uh, through our uh, Institute of Public Affairs. So you can borrow a lot. A lot of cities have done a lot of research on it. But you want to cater it, you know, meet the particular needs of your city. Uh, but you shouldn't just rely solely on Robert's rules. My opinion. He's coming back. Okay. Thank you. Well, we, we have the, the citizen who submitted the letter asking the city to look at those the, the election procedures just walked out the door but uh, yeah, I think he may have a question would you mind if he I, mean, I, I know you're, you're here to present to the council but I mean I have, I have no objection to him asking a question to clarify something for him or sure I don't uh, but, but he just walked meeting. out so I don't know 
<clears throat> okay. Jeff, we do want to thank you for keeping oh. your tax dollars in Marion, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still live in Marion. It's cheaper to live here than in Iowa City. <laughs> and I have my house bought and paid for, which is... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is Mr. Mr. Knutson. He initiated this, this yeah, request. We know, so uh, we oh, know each other. We've known each other for a long time. time. Okay, so. uh, I'm Charlie Knutson, 2835 24th Avenue, Marion. First of all, a couple comments. I believe in having a strong ward representative that looks out for a certain section of the town. That's one person out of seven. If that one person wants to fight for something in their ward for their people, that's great. But you still got the six other people that will make sure that the best for the city gets done. But you have a strong advocate for your ward. In the last two elections, we have had ward representatives elected, not by the people in their ward, but, but because of the system that Marion has, they've been elected to that ward position, but as a result of people outside their ward voting for them. I don't like that. I don't think that's right. I, you know, in the state of Iowa, how many senators do we have, state senators? 90? I mean, 50 or something like that? You only vote for the person, that state senator. I don't get to vote for every state senator in Iowa, even though I live in Iowa, and they're representing my interests. We should have ward representatives in this town elected by it. There's plenty of communities in town, in, in the community, in the world that do that. I think that's the way it should be done. And I don't understand, and I know there's some people on the council here that have that same opinion. And I know there's some people on this council who have been elected to the office they have because of the present system we have. And I have no problem with those people being on our council right now because they got there by the system we presently have. I just don't think it's right. I talked to a lot of people in our community about our, our, our election system, and it amazes me how many people in our community really do not understand our present voting system. And I think some education of our community, because when I talk to people and actually explain to them how this is done, they, they actually seem shocked about it. I've asked the council here what I need to do to push this forward so that we have an option in this town. Maybe to, Can the council yourselves make this change? Or, does this, or is this something that has to go to the vote of the community? I've asked that question. I have not gotten any response back on that. I've asked, do I need to get a... Petition it. How many voters do I need to have sign this petition? I have not gotten a response back on that. You bring in somebody that's very knowledgeable. Of course, the first thing he, he gives is his opinion that Marion's the best way of doing it. I have a problem with that. Come in and talk to us about what goes on in this world, but don't come in with somebody that's going to support your position. And I think that is what occurred today. I Does anybody got any questions of me? Charlie, I can Thank assure you. you that's not what happened. Thank you. Okay. Does the council have any questions of me? We're just trying to get educated on the subject, and we ask, we ask for, for someone who's an expert on the subject. Okay, um, but I'm asking the council, do you have any questions of me or what I need to do? I've asked you guys for help, some guidance, some direction of what the city allows, what, what is the system to make this change? The, the system we currently have was voted that way by the voters. And I don't remember, Jeff, if you were here then, but we voted to elect the four at large and the, and the, uh, and then the second thing on the other ballot, Don would remember, was whether they'd be elected at large or by war. I think we voted on that. That's what I did. That was the Joe Painter thing, wasn't it? Do you remember that vote, Don? No, other than the charter. And, and, out in the city charter. and the charter would have been under Joe Painter. That could be. I wasn't city attorney. Well, though. that's probably. Oh, but you know. Yeah. I think the charter was before the Joe point Painter. Is that it was voted on. Yeah. yeah. I think so. the charter was from the. the Robert 60s. M. L. Um, and I, I don't work. I wasn't here. I don't know if it was the charter was voted on or, or the council had the authority I, just to I believe it was. I think it was. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, I mean, Marion adopted the home rule charter after that option was given to cities by the state constitutional amendment. I'd, but I don't know if the current voting system was adopted as part of that original charter or if it was something that was altered sure. um, we, yeah. as the community changed or got bigger. We'd have to do a little research and digging on that. As we far have as reached a point line where each ward is 40 or 10,000 people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have whole councils representing 10,000 people in a lot of cities in the state of Iowa. So yeah. that's another thought anyway. And there are really two avenues for amending the charter. Um, we've looked into that in the past when some other issues came up. And if I remember correctly, the city council has the ability to pass an ordinance that amends the charter that's subject to the reverse referendum petition requirement. Um, and the other way that a charter can be amended is by citizen-initiated petition. Uh, I don't know what the number of signatures are or what the process is for that. That take a little legal research or else the, um, maybe we could call the county auditor's office and see if they have some experience with that. Oh, I think if, if we're going to do this well, by way of uh, petition, that it should be done expeditiously so that it is comes before the voter at this year's election when the most people are going to be out voting. All I ask, Council, let me know if you can make this decision and vote. And uh, granted, if you make a decision not to change it, then what do I have to do to, to move it so that uh, the voters have an option on it? Uh -oh. And like, the sooner the better. Thank please. you. Thank you. Okay. I, I have a I have a question for Mr. Shato. Um, so what what do you uh, make of the the question about or the comparison to state legislature and that? Well, yes, it's a valid point. I thought, but it's um. But what I, again? I just go from personal experience. My the situation I've seen too many cities have is where that ward council member, all they're concerned about is what's happening in their ward and not what's happening in the whole city. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that's a policy issue that you have to wrestle with. Sure. And, um, you know, for some cities, maybe have more homogeneous, that may not be a big problem. I've seen particularly cities where the dis disparities in in uh, socioeconomic or perhaps uh, racial issues and within communities, that can be a real problem. And so that, that has to be really considered. Okay. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Knudsen. And we'll, I mean, in my, in my opinion, to change the charter, you have to, I mean, you sh we should be more, we should be very thoughtful about it. We should make sure you don't, this is not something you do every day. You don't change the charter every day. It's like changing the Constitution or, you know, this is something we need to approach carefully, be very thoughtful about it. If, if everybody, you know, agrees that a change is needed, that's fine. But I, I just don't think that we should be hasty in doing something like that. Um, I, you know, it was done that way for a reason. I think we need to study it and, and make sure that it is the right thing for the community before we make the change because it's not something you do every day. Well, my opinion is, of course, you know I have an opinion, uh, is that at, at the time this was passed, the number of people that lived in Marion is equal to the number of people who live in one ward. So it's, I mean, the number has increased yep. immensely. So that's valid. Yeah. My opinion. Thank you. Okay. Good discussion. What next? One more sure. thing. One thing sure. I'd say is. Don't drag your feet on this. I know you want to do it. You want to do it right. You want to be thoughtful about it. But don't drag your feet. Thank you. Next. 
Uh, item number three is a discussion regarding a lease agreement proposal for a site for uptown parking. Uh, the council had previously seen a uh, concept design that would call for an area up at the corner of 8th Avenue and uh, 12th Street to eventually become a parking ramp that would serve the uptown area. Uh, and analyzing the costs of doing that right now, it's just really beyond Marion's capacity to be able to afford that. Um, it's one of those cases where you could either afford to build it or afford to operate it, but not both. Uh, the community hasn't matured to the point yet where we've got standalone sources of income, for example, to be able to support parking ramps. If you look around at communities that have them, places like Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, you know, Cedar Rapids charges for on-street parking, that is a big part of what pays for the cost to maintain and operate their parking ramp system around the community. And to me, that's a broader discussion that uh, needs some time and thought put into it for looking at Marion as the uptown changes. Uh, so what the company has put together is a proposal to um, do kind of an interim solution where they're offering to provide the city a site that's basically a blank slate that we could go into and install a surface parking lot on for a period of five years with an option to extend it. Um, I have not approached public service yet to get a cost estimate about what it would cost to put that in. And just looking at a couple of potential parking spot layouts, we could yield uh, 40 to 42 parking spaces on that site that we could then lease. They'd be public parking that would be available um, during the lease term. Um, they've just given us a proposal for a lease. Uh, if the council wants to continue to uh, us to continue to explore that, then we would put a uh, resolution on for Thursday directing staff to enter into negotiations for a uh, parking lease for the uptown and then we'll get down to the brass tacks on what it would cost to build the lot so that we could give you the full financial picture for it. Location. Location, Lon? Uh, it'd be where, oh, it's where Don's building is. <laughs> right across the street from the Methodist and the Presbyterian churches, that corner lot. That's the block they were going to buy and tear down and build a ramp in there. And yeah, this gives them really the opportunity to acquire the property, um, lets us solve the parking pro a parking issue in the interim, but then they can kind of bank the property for a future development project. Questions for Lon? It would be interesting to know what the cost would be in demolition and everything for 40 or 50 parking places and all that. Have you done research on um, other cities that lease parking like that? Because what was it, 75000 a year? There, it um, varies quite a bit. What you really want to get down to is what's your cost per spot during the uh, lifetime of the spot. Because, you know, we know that, for example, a parking spot in an elevated <coughs> parking structure is going to be somewhere around $30,000 a space if you're doing on-street parking, seven to $11,000 per space. So as long as you're somewhere in the middle between those two ranges, it becomes a judgment call by the council on whether or not the public benefit outweighs the cost of what you're seeking to do. You know, in this case, we're looking at something that would not be considered to be, you know, a long-term parking solution for the uptown, but really just to have a strategic location where we could enhance the parking for a lot of the area, um, knowing that at some point in the future, it's going to revert back to private use for a building project. Or if we reach the point where in five years, eight years, we've um, gotten to the point where we can support <coughs> a full-on parking structure in that location. So, Lon, you're just, you're seeking a collective idea here as to whether to proceed with it or not? Yeah, there's not um, much point in us putting time or effort into it or them continuing to put time or effort into it if the council isn't supportive of the concept. Uh, if you're supportive of the concept, we'll do the uh, resolution to direct us to enter into negotiations and start working on hammering out the details to bring that formal proposal back to council. Well, I still think the, the ideal place would be next door at the lot that uh, the Katz brothers and the library foundation provided. And if that was a ramped parking place, it would serve city hall, it would serve the library, it would serve the uptown uh, functions that go on because y all you have to do on a Thursday is see how many people are carrying their chairs and they're walking 
to the park. And if there was a parking uh, spot that was closer, I'm sure that they'd appreciate that. I, as an individual, am not interested in pursuing this, going back to the original topic here. So okay. in my opinion, I, I don't see the value. We have so much going on right now. We don't know what's going to happen with the library. We don't know what some of this construction is doing. In my opinion, we, we got to, it's, it's not feasible to me. That's my opinion, that I would be in uh, favor of not moving forward with it. And I agree with you. But there is one thing I would like to bring up, and maybe this isn't the appropriate time. Sixth uh, Avenue is becoming a real son of a gun to try to get across, and there needs to be some four-way stops on Sixth Avenue. It's a little congested now. I work on that, so it obviously it's with all of our construction, it's very tight right now. Okay, but back on this <laughs> topic. Sorry. Uh, any other questions for Lon? Was so, it? I'm sorry. So uh, on Thursday, will be there'll be a vote on whether or not council wants wants them to pursue this negotiation. So, would it be taking down the law office and the, like the hair salon? Or is uh, it all going away? No, just the law office. The law office. Okay. Right, I just didn't, because originally that was going to be good yeah, too. Yeah, but there's that out, there's still a yeah. easement right there. Questions? Okay. Uh, number four uh, is a resolution setting a public hearing for the sale of property. Uh, Anderson Automotive is interested in buying the corner lot at 3rd Avenue and 44th Street. Uh, this would be part of the plat that uh, Tom presented earlier with the former Fiberite site. It will allow them to build a new building. They're looking at uh, right at 12,000 square feet for a new facility on that corner. Um, we would be looking to sell that property for $30,000 per acre. Uh, the only thing that would be left to do after the platting is done, you know, typical land transaction abstract has to be created for the new lot description. We do need to provide um, sanitary sewer into the site because when it was originally done, um, there were two sewer laterals run into the larger parcel, but neither one of them ends up being on this piece. So we'll provide that into the site. And then uh, once it's through the transaction process, he'd be ready to get his site plan submitted, approved, and start to build. Questions? Uh, number eight, then, is a resolution approving an amendment to our 2080 agreement with Cedar Rapids. Um, when we originally started down this path, um, Marion had to create a civil rights commission because we passed the magic 30,000 population threshold in the last census. Uh, we had no experience with it locally, uh, no experience with it on our legal department side, so we entered into an agreement with Cedar Rapids to help provide staff support to get our program up and running and build some capacity to be able to handle these locally. They a large role for us at first, um, but that role has really started to diminish. Uh, a lot of the things that we originally anticipated that they were going to have to help us with, um, for example, the state will do those investigations for civil rights issues on our behalf. There's only a few issues where they have to be done locally. So the 2080 agreement has been reformatted and redone to represent the services that they will be providing for us going forward and not what it's taken to get us to this point. We just we just got that uh, we just got that um, document and I would think that we need considerably more time than just two even two days to look at it. Is there an urgency on this approving it, Lon? I think as long as we're done by the uh, end of the fiscal year on that one, we're fine. So we can move it to the next meeting for approval or yeah. for consideration. Good idea. Everybody, give everybody some more time to read it. Yeah, it has to be approved on the uh, Cedar Rapids side as well. Okay. Okay. See, Amanda just said Cedar Rapids has taken action on it already. They have. And they have I have a question. Uh, I had asked Lon in an earlier meeting because I feel that Cedar Rapids violates agreements at times. Are they, have you reviewed our 2080 agreements and are they living by the orders? The ones that I've looked at, they are living by that. Uh, one of the things that we was a little surprised to find is that, um, you know, we've been paying them, for example, uh, transportation costs 
for many years. We can't find that there was actually a formal agreement behind that. It just appears to be a longstanding practice. Um, the sanitary sewer agreement, they've been abiding by that. Um, obviously, Ryan has outlined what the new agreement will look like that will be coming to council, so they'll have a whole new series. Um, they've been abiding by the 2080 agreement that we have establishing the annexation boundary between C Avenue and Albernet Road. Um, and even with the fair play agreement, while we didn't necessarily like the way some of the things played out, they did abide by the rules of what's in the, tw in the particular 28 agreement itself. I think it's one of those cases where um, you know, sometimes what's written down on paper um, doesn't necessarily feel right when it's carried out in practice, but we did not discover anything where it looked like they were not abiding by the terms of the contracts. Thank you. And, and just to just wanted to note, if this 28E agreement um, is not approved by the City Council, um, we would have to hire s investigative staff. So they are providing expertise that we do not have from a legal standpoint. We do have our Assistant City Attorney Devin attend all of the meetings and provide legal counsel on Marion's behalf, but they provide all of the intake services and they uh, transfer all of the cases to either the State, Iowa Civil Rights Commission, or to HUD, and then they do the other investigative um, work in-house that cannot be transferred. So just for clarification, they are providing a service that we would otherwise have to staff with the city. Okay. Full-time staff? Full-time staff? Right. They have full-time staff available for us. It's ours as needed. Mm -hmm. They have a full um, division dedicated to civil rights. Status quo. I think Riley. So, do we still want more time to read the agreement, or oh, I, yeah, okay? Yeah. Very so good. we're gonna just proceed with that, but it move it one meeting back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item number 17 is the ratification of the uh, contract with the city and the Marion Police Protective Association. Uh, this is a four-year collective bargaining agreement, with is, which is consistent with the four-year agreement that we put together with AFSCME. Uh, the terms in it are comparable to AFSCME and to the fire contract. One of the things that we've uh, strived to do is make sure that we're treating employees consistently and equitably amongst the three different bargaining units. And uh, I don't know that we've gotten a four-year contract before. This, uh, at least since I've been here, it's the first time we've been able to lock it up that long. Times are tough. It's terrific. I can, well, that's good. Yeah, no, I think it's terrific. It'd be nice for the new chief not to have to deal with it for uh, <laughs> three or four years. And then uh, number 18 and number 19, uh, Tracy in my office was doing some forecasting for council meeting dates into, the, into next year. And there's quite a few places where there's going to be conflicts with holidays and days that City Hall is closed. So uh, she's got a couple of resolutions for the council to consider to move those around and make sure that we're avoiding holidays. On, on that topic, Mon, I, I think, have we, are we working on setting the setting meeting? I think we did, did we? We give clear direction whether or not about on the um, doing the work sessions in the wards. Yep. Are we setting dates for those? Or yeah, we're, we're working on that. on that, getting some locations and dates together. Okay. I w I would just like to make one comment about uh, selecting a ward member. One would hope that people who were running for city council are mature enough to be able to see the whole picture rather than just with blinders on, one would hope. I have a question on Hold Harmless. Um, so one of them in here, I'm looking through the packet, there was there was a race, and I guess I want to find out the policy. So it was a, r a run, and it says to submit race plan or you know the map, and there was no map attached to it. Was there a map? that just didn't get put in, or did they not submit a map, and is that required for us to approve a hold harmless or a run that they have to submit a map? I'm not picking on this particular one, I'm just wondering the policy. I can't get the document open. Uh, was that B or C, Will? B. C, okay. We'll take a look. Do they, <coughs> is it policy for this that they have to submit a map with any run before it gets approved? 
that's really my question. Normally <laughs> we want to see the route as part of the evaluation process for the staff. Um, that one I'm not familiar with. So, I mean, if it was something, for example, that was going to be done entirely within the park, then normally the council wouldn't need to see the map for something like that. The other part with the map supplies to the use of public resources for closing streets, diverting traffic, et cetera. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, Mike. Yeah, I'm trying to, if I remember right, I think they were just using the Boyson Trail um, for that walk run okay. and typically if they're just using a, a trail within the system you know we usually don't have them provide a map of the route if they're on a public trail I think we get more into the specific routes of, of those runs uh, when they're on city streets sure, that type sure. of thing I'm okay. trying to recall that the hold harmless but if that if I remember right I think that's what they were doing was just on the well I didn't see anything written about that in the yeah. What we got. So. I think Mike's right on that because many of this route can come up from the police department because we need to decide if we need to have officers there, if they're going to pay for officers to be there, or if they're going to have security. So we requested we want to see the route. But if it's inside of a park like that, uh, it's not necessary. But anytime they're going to get out on the streets or anybody, it's a public safety thing. And so that really came from the police department years ago. Sure. Makes sense. Lon, I had a question in reference to these three employees and this deferred compensation agreement. When that comes up, is that just, are they entering in the agreement? Uh, can you explain to me what, what that is and why that would appear here? It's going to be 14, 15, and 16. Yeah, those are employees that have requested to have some of their compensation deferred. It's somewhat similar to a 401k, but city governments have 457s. It is just their money. The city doesn't put any money in. But either at the time of employment or sometimes um, we have somebody come in and speak about um, different benefits that the city offers. We have two different companies that we use for those deferred okay, compensation. Okay, so plans. the reason they're appearing here is because they haven't been participating right, in the past. Right, it's when they first. And they're requesting right, to do that now. That okay, is correct. I'm sorry. Perfect. I, I'm very familiar with that. I was just, okay. I didn't understand. Um, yes, yeah, when they first start here. the deferrals of their compensation. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>